So what is, what is the idea of systemic racism? The fundamental idea behind systemic racism is the idea that if you look at blacks today in America, and if you look at whites today in America, what you observe are large inequalities, inequalities. There are wealth inequalities. There are income inequalities. There are educational outcome inequalities. So however you slice it, and this is just true, this is the data shows, right? The average black is poorer than the average white, the average, uh, the mean or the median, it doesn't really matter. The same is true of the different deciles, the same is true of, of education, the same is true of, uh, by every measure, there's certainly an inequality between people of different skin color. Now, I think, you know, we can talk about the reasons for that, but certainly it is legitimate to argue that one of the reasons for that is past racism. To some extent, that's true. To some extent, it's true that because blacks couldn't buy homes because of, uh, 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 you know, Jim Crow laws and because of redlining, 50 years ago, they didn't, bring, they didn't build equity, they uh, didn't build wealth, uh, they, they uh, didn't uh, leave that wealth to their children, and it just hasn't been, because of the history of racism in America, because of the history of slavery in America, there hasn't been the intergenerational ability to create and build wealth. And that is true. There's no doubt about it. Right? There's no doubt about it. But that leaves advocates with a problem. That's not what they mean by systemic. We'll get to what they mean by systemic in a minute. But that leaves the advocates with a problem. That's racism in the past. What do we do about racism in the past? If the racism happened a long time ago, there's nothing you can actually do about this. Because if there's no racism right now, the racism is past racism, then yeah, maybe we should have reparations, maybe. But that's not going to be very politically uh, uh, popular. I mean, you could tell blacks to suck it up. And, you know, yes, they had a rotten past. It sucks. You know, it's time now to go to work, start saving. Start making money and grow wealth. But of course, the people who advocate for systemic racism certainly don't want to say that because their agenda is far more expansive than about racism. Because fundamentally, these people are egalitarians. Fundamentally, their agenda is about equality. And they've observed one example of inequality. And they need an explanation for it that can justify doing something about it. So they've come up with this concept of systemic racism. Systemic racism is not racism you can point at. It's not racism we can say this policy or this person is a racist. They don't want to do that because they have a hard time finding them. I, you know, there are plenty of racists in America, but it's not overt anymore. And most of them hide, and it's not culturally okay to be a racist. So it's hard to point at stuff. And with regard to laws, most laws have not only negated past racism, they've turned it upside down in a sense that they now have reverse racism, which is what affirmative action is. They benefit blacks over whites. Jeff. So what they're really complaining about is the fact of inequality needs to be solved. And a powerful tool for them to solve it is to call it racism. 
Because racism is something nobody likes, something everybody can rally against. Racism is something we might even accept some redistribution of wealth around. We might accept attempts to fix the inequality. But what they really upset about is the inequality. And what they really hate are the successful. So it doesn't matter, for example, that you point out to them that blacks, people with black skin, from Nigeria or from the Caribbean, who are brand new immigrants to America, but who have the same black skin as they do, seem to do great in America, seem to work hard, make a living, do OK. They're not rich, although Nigerians, as I said, are the most educated. But they're very successful. And indeed, when you get to education inequality, you don't see the gap that you see between whites and blacks. You don't see that gap once you include black immigrants into this country, whether they come from Africa or whether they come from um, the Caribbean, which is interesting from all kinds of dimensions. Right. So one of the things McCoy that writes about is, so he takes on one issue of this inequality and digs deeper into it. So black kids tend to underperform scholastically compared to white kids. And he posits a number of different reasons this could possibly happen. The classical argument is that black kids go to lousy, unfunded schools. True. So, all right, well, let's try to take that out of the equation. Let's look only at black kids in decent schools, right? And it turns out that even in good schools, the scholastic gap still exists. There's a gap between white students and black students in education, in test scores, if you will. All right, so why is this? Why is it that black kids lag behind white kids in normal schools? Well, the next explanation is, you know, uh, is that black parents, because they didn't attend college and because they often work more than one job, they don't have the, quote, cultural capital to shepherd their kids into good study habits. But here you come against black immigrants who come into this country, who work more than one job, who have not gone to college, grow up in poor Caribbean families or poor African families, and yet their kids don't exhibit the same gap. Don't exhibit the same gap. Okay, so here you have, so it can be, it doesn't look like it's just underfunded schools, although clearly underfunded, lousy, horrible inner city schools are a big part of this. And, um, but even when you control for that, you look at normal schools, black underperformed. So you say it's the parents. But when you look at the background of immigrant parents from same color skin, immigrant parents, their kids do fine. So then there's a sub-argument that says, well, immigrants are especially determined, self-directed people, and it's unfair to expect that kind of effort from native-born people. Well, <laughs> why? Why is it unfair? Why shouldn't everybody be expected to work hard in order to achieve things in life? I mean, wouldn't it be great if we all behaved like immigrants in that regard? It's, it's kind of funny because here we're talking about immigrants as working hard and particularly determined and self-disciplined, self-directed people and so on. But then if we switch the conversation 
I talk about immigration, then immigrants are portrayed as as uh, lazy and welfare recipients, and they don't do anything, and they, we need to get rid of them, and they're a scourge on American society. So, yeah. can't win on the immigration debate. But as John McCuther mentions, he says we get closer to the truth in examining what black kids' attitudes towards school are, and maybe they have something to do with the problem. So when black kids are asked why they do homework, they say they do the homework for the teacher. When white kids are asked why they do the homework, they say they do the homework for the parents. Now, McWhither interprets this as meaning that the stimulus for them doing the homework is external for black kids. They view school as a foreign thing. They have a responsibility to it over there. White kids, it's part of what's expected in the family. It's part of who they are and what they are. So they internalize it. Right? Internalize it. So, and he points out that in black culture, doing well in school, being a good student, doing your homework, doing well on tests, is considered being white, is considered being the other, is considered being bad in a sense, out of culture, out of norm, out of norm. So he argued that much of the reason for black underperformance at school is due to subtle attitudinal factor. In other words, and this is, I think, true for the entire inequality issue, it has to do with culture. It has to do with culture within black communities. It has to do with culture within, among black students. It has to do with the attitudes towards success how success is attained, how success is achieved. It has to do with attitudes towards education. It has to do with attitudes towards school. Peer pressure is a cultural phenomenon. Peer pressure comes from your culture. And it's not fought against by the leaders of the culture, by the intellectuals, by the artists, by the rappers. by the community leaders, by the politicians. Indeed, it's encouraged by them because they thrive on a culture of victimhood. It's much easier to say, I'm a victim of racism. And I don't even have to point to a particular racist because I'm a victim of systemic racism. It's the invisible kind. It's the kind you can't see. It's the kind that doesn't really I can't point to. That's much better explanation. And it's explanation that the leaders of this culture are responsible for. And I blame them. I don't blame the people. I blame their leaders. The roots are not in IQ differences because then you wouldn't see Nigerians do so well in school. Nigerians do phenomenally well in school, better than whites. And their educational attainment is spectacular. You wouldn't see blacks in the Caribbean doing so well in school. Again, great, great, great grandchildren of slaves. And yet they come here with ambition. They come here with a proper culture. Whoops. Sorry, we're just spammed by uh, Mujahid. Um, it's not selection bias. Anyway, I, I'm not going to get an IQ debate because I think IQ is is a is a is a 
in many respects meaningless. Um, there's a lot that should be done and can be done in the black communities to, ch to address these problems. These are real issues. These are real kids suffering. These are real issues that have to do with cultural phenomena that can be fixed. Getting rid of racism is not the issue. It's getting rid of a culture of victimhood, a culture of defeatism, a culture of entitlement. But, of course, and that's what John McCorder ultimately argues, but that, of course, is not in the, not in the political discourse, unfortunately. And if you, you mention it, and I'm sure I'll be called a racist for even talking about it. And, and by the way, I blame the intellectuals, black intellectuals. I blame the black leadership. I blame black politicians. And, and maybe, importantly, I blame black rapper, r rappers, musicians. I mean, they have a huge impact on the culture. Many of them have made a lot of money off of capitalism. And I would suggest that you know, if they had a different attitude towards all of this, they could have a real impact on that culture and a real change, a real change. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there. Help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share. And uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>